Yes, my wife is. She's had it from the early days. Because she didn't feel good, which normally she just would have brushed off. But one day my son Jesse went to urgent care and tested positive. Which flu. What's interesting is he had COVID twice, no symptoms. And here he had the flu and it put him a day in bed. Right on the flu. Right on the flu. It took Michelangelo four years to craft his statue of David. It's 13 feet tall. And the interesting thing is he used flawed marble. We know the exact quarry that the marble came from. In fact, um, there was another artist that rejected the marble because it had breaks and impurities in it. But Michelangelo was able to see past those impurities to the core of the marble and he said, and that appropriately describes this man from the Old Testament called King David. He wasn't always King David. He was just David in the beginning. But King David, he was broken and he was flawed. He had a lot of imperfections, but God saw his core. The core of who he was, his heart, and who we are in our heart is who we are when we're alone. It's a part of us that only God sees. It's where our, our passions, our fantasies, our desires, our commitments reside. And God looked at David's core, at his heart, and found somebody he could work with. So like Michelangelo, he began to mold his masterpiece. And God looks at all of us like that. He looks at our hearts and he says, I, wanna, I want you to have a heart that I can mold and I can shape into my masterpiece. I want to make your marriage, your family, your life, your future, your plans into a masterpiece. And then he asks a question. Will you let me? Will you allow me to mold and shape you into the person I want you to be? And that question is posed to all of us, and only we can answer that. Today we're going to look at, in the next several weeks, we're going to look at a series on the call, Broken. Today we're talking broken, but still chosen. We're going to look at David and Saul. We're going to look at both of their hearts. Because God rejected Saul because of his heart. But he chose David because of his heart. One man basically lived as if there were no God. Sure, Saul acknowledged God with his mouth. But he sort of lived like, a, uh, like an atheist. His heart revealed that he really didn't believe God and his word. The heart of David, however, was much different. And as we look at their hearts, I want you to ask yourself, what is my default? And for those who don't know what I mean by default, default is what you naturally go back to. It's not that we're going to not sin. We are. We will. We're going to sin, but if we have a heart given to Jesus Christ, we're not going to be comfortable with that. Our default is going to be repentance. Our default is going to be obedience. Our default is going to be humility. Our default is going to be the things that make and mark the heart of David. 
So when God rejects Saul as king, he sends a prophet, a guy named Samuel, to choose the next king. And actually, God does the choosing. He sends Samuel to the house of Jesse, who has eight sons. And he tells Jesse to bring the sons out one by one because God had told him to anoint the person that's going to be the next king. And so Jesse brings out his seven oldest sons. Very impressive guys. And so one by one, Samuel goes through them and God whispers in his ear, no, nope, not him. Nope, not him. And then the Lord says something very interesting to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16, 7. He says, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things a man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God was looking at his core, at his heart. God tells Samuel that none of these seven guys, as impressive as they are, are going to be the next king. So Samuel, he asks Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? And Jesse, almost as an afterthought, he goes, oh, my youngest is up taking care of the sheep. And Samuel says, I'm going to stay here until you bring him to me. I want to see if he's the one. David is probably about a 15-year-old at this point, and God says to Samuel when he comes in, he's the one. I have seen his heart. He's the one I'm going to work with. Anoint him as the next king. It would be about 15 years before David would become king, but God sets him aside. Now let's take a look at these two different hearts. Let's look at Saul's heart first. God rejects the heart of Saul. It's our heart's default. If our heart's default is like Saul's, then God will say that we need to get our hearts right. But that can only happen when we surrender to Jesus Christ and make him the Lord of our lives, not just somebody in the Bible that we read. So, as I go through this, ask yourself, do I have a heart like Saul, or do I have a heart like David? Let's look at the heart God rejects. And let's look at Saul. Number one, Saul lacked confidence in God. At one point, God tells Samuel to tell Saul to do something. And he also tells Samuel that Saul will find some people prophesying and God's spirit will enable Saul to prophesy too. In other words, God says that he will do some supernatural things in Saul and he will speak for God, and Saul does. And Saul obeys. And he goes and he prophesies and he actually speaks God's word and supernatural things do happen. And God says he's going to empower Saul at that point. But in 1 Samuel 10, we see that Saul's faith is fleeting. It says this, finally Saul of Kish was chosen to be king. Now this is before Saul was anointed the king, okay? He's about to be anointed. Finally Saul of Kish was chosen to be king. When they looked for him, he was not found. So they inquired further of the Lord, has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he is here. He has hidden himself among the baggage. I had to look up that word baggage because I thought maybe they got it wrong and just paraphrased what the enemy says. So God had already told Saul that he's going to do great things through him and in him. That he was going to do supernatural work in Saul's life. God wanted to show him that he's a God of power that he would strengthen him. But when it comes time for Saul to be king, he's hiding among the suitcases. Why is he hiding? Especially after God confirms that he's going to empower him. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. He's hiding because his confidence only goes as far as his own 
abilities. Did you hear that? Yeah. He placed confidence in his own abilities. We see this in Saul's time again and again and again. His confidence extends as far as his own strengths, his own gifts, his own talents. But he never seems to trust God and his word. But you and I can act the same way. We can live a life thinking it's all up to us. We can say with our mouths that there is a God and we believe in him, but in our hearts we might live as if there is no God. Kind of like Saul. Our confidence only extends as far as our own strengths and our own abilities. Like Saul, we might know that there's a God, but we're hiding among the baggage. When we're supposed to face the things that God puts in front of us. We can quickly forget that we are more than conquerors in Christ. We think it's up to us. We forget that anything is possible with Jesus Christ. We hear it, we read it. But do we really buy into it? The second problem with Saul's heart was impatience. He didn't wait on God. When the Israelite armies were surrounded by the Philistine army, Saul was waiting for Samuel to show up because they weren't going to go to battle until Samuel offered a sacrifice to God, to ask God to be with them in battle. And Samuel said that he was going to show up when God told him it was time to show up. And then he would offer the sacrifice. Saul waits for seven days. And Samuel still hasn't shown up. And some of Saul's, uh, Saul's soldiers were starting to leave the battlefield, and Saul was getting really nervous. So what does he do? He decides to offer the burnt offering, to take Samuel's role on himself, and so he does. And as soon as he lights the fire, for the sacrifice, Samuel comes and says, What have you done, Saul? And Saul said, When I see the when I saw the men scattering, and that you did not come at the set time, and the Philistines were assembling in Michmash, I thought, quote, verse Samuel 13, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled. Offer the burnt offering myself. So, what's the big deal? The big deal is God told him to wait. God told Saul that he would lead him into battle. Remember, God said, I'm going to do supernatural things to you if you let me. God was going to lead Saul in his timing, but Saul didn't have patience to wait. I thought sometimes we act the same way. I've worked with a lot of young adults. And I've heard some of them say, you know, I get physical needs. And God gave me these needs, but God hasn't provided a spouse for me. So I'm not going to wait on you, God. I've got this desire in my heart to be married. So instead of waiting on you to come through for me, I'm going to take matters into my own hand. The first eligible person that comes along, they end up getting married. Usually doesn't end well. I'm tired of waiting on you, God. How often do we feel that we don't say it? It's not a Christian thing to say. How many believers have done exactly that because they're tired of waiting on God? And so we jump the gun, we take matters into our own hands. But like he did with Saul, God says, I can't work with you if you don't want to wait on me. At your core, you won't wait. The third problem with Saul's heart is that he doesn't obey God. 
On another occasion, God gives Saul explicit instructions not to take the spoil after the battle, which tends to be something that happened back then. You know, a uh, a community, and you take all the things that are worth anything. And so Saul defeats his enemies, and instead of listening, he looks at all these flocks and herds, and he says, you're going to be ashamed to waste all them. And so he takes them, makes them his own. And in response to Saul's disobedience, Samuel comes and asks Saul if he obeyed God. And Saul says yes. When Samuel, he hears the bleeding of the sheep in the background. So Samuel confronts Saul, and Saul says this. And you've got to give him credit for the first sentence here. He goes, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. The last phrase is key. I was afraid of the people, so I gave in to them. And this gives us a real glimpse into Saul's heart. He was disobedient because he was afraid what the people would think of him. He was afraid that people would reject him. He was afraid that people would think less of him. He was more concerned about the people's opinions than God's opinions. See, that was his default in his heart. If we're more interested in pleasing people than pleasing God, then God says he can't work with us. The audience of Saul's heart was not God, it was the people. He cared how he acted before the people. But he didn't really care how he acted before God. He maybe said it, but he didn't buy into it. And we act like Saul sometimes when we make decisions based on the approval of other people. And let's face it, there could be a lot of pressure there. The fourth reason why God rejects Saul is he never learned to trust in God. We see the story of David and Goliath. We all know it. When it comes time for Saul's army to face the Philistines, the the Philistines send out this nine-foot-tall guy, seasoned warrior, Goliath. He must have been an impressive sight. Nine-foot-tall, he was an Anakin from the land of the giants. And he's a skilled warrior. He could beat the best of the best. He taunts the Israelites, and he makes a deal with them. You send your best out, whoever wins. The other tribe becomes the other tribe's service. The Philistines will serve Israel if you guys win. And the Israelites will serve the Philistines if I win. In 1 Samuel 17, it says, On hearing the Philistines, Goliath's words, Saul and the Israelites were filled with the strength of the Lord. So all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So how does Paul and Saul respond to this challenge, this conflict, this crisis, this giant in front of him? He's dismayed and terrified. Why? He never learned to trust in God. All he could see was the giant, was the problem, was the crisis. He never learned to trust that God was with him. He faced his problems as if there were no God. He acknowledged God with his mouth, but in his heart he lived as if God didn't exist. Tim, I couldn't help but think about what you shared. With everything that's been going on these last few years, we can easily get focused on the bad things. We forget that we've got a great big God behind us. And that's what we do when we try to face our problems alone, thinking there's no God where he's not going to come to our aid or thinking that God is not powerful enough to help us face our struggles. We try to defeat our problems and our crises with our own strength and with our own abilities. You know, in the 12 steps, the first step is recognizing your powerlessness 
We need to do the same thing when we face our problems. The second step we need to take is to recognize that there is a God. The third is that we need to recognize that we need to surrender to the power of God. That's what Saul needed to do. He needed to say there is a God of power and I'm not facing this giant alone. I can face this giant with God. But he never learned to trust in God. When you face giants, challenges, and crises in your life, do you face them with God in your mind? Or do you think it's all to you? The fifth reason why God rejected Saul is he never repented. He never came clean in his heart. Sure, Saul said he was sorry, but his heart never really changed. It's easy to let, I'm sorry, roll off your tongue. It's a little bit different to say, let my heart be changed. In 1 Samuel 13, Samuel basically calls Saul a fool. He says, you acted foolishly. Samuel said, you have not kept the command of the Lord your God. If you had, you would have, been, if you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Isn't that interesting? If Saul would have obeyed and surrendered his heart to God, Jesus would have probably been born from the lineage of Saul, not the lineage of David. I wonder if David had Saul in mind when he wrote Psalm 114.1, and he says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. No, not one. With our mouths, we might say that there is a God, but in our hearts, we might act like a soul, living as if there is no God. We face the challenges as if there's no God. We operate as if it's all up to us. And we're told that the fool is an atheist who is not the atheist who says there's no God. It's the fool who is also a person who mouths the words but lives with the heart like Saul. And so God rejected Saul's heart. Now let's look at the heart God accepts. Now let's look at David. So God rejects Saul's heart and says, Saul, you might say that there's a God with your mouth, but the default of your heart says there is no God. If your heart, in your heart, it, it's all up to you. In your heart, you're still living to please other people. You're not living to please me, God says. So God rejects his heart. God chooses and anoints this young boy, David. David was the kind of heart God wants at his core. At his core. Did he have imperfections, impurities, just like Michelangelo's piece of marble? Of course he did. We all know them. The Bible is clear. The man was far from perfect. But at his core, <laughs> he was right. Let's look. First, David was humble. He's anointed as the next king of Israel. David didn't boast to his brothers. He didn't gloat and think he was superior. He didn't say, I'm not going back to tend the sheep. What are you guys doing? Hey, I'm going to be king. I don't know when it's going to happen, David might have said. But sooner or later, you're going to bow down to me. I'm the next king, not you. And after he was anointed, what did David do? It says that he returned back to the field to take care of the sheep in his care. God chose David because he was humble. But he also chose David because he had a shepherd's heart. 
He cared for the sheep. They were dirty. They were defenseless. They were dependent. But he had to care for them, and he learned how to be a shepherd out in those fields. He had a shepherd's heart, and later on, David was still a shepherd. Saul drafts him into his service because he was also an incredible musician. And so he would play the harp for Saul when he was stressed. In addition, we're told that he was a great warrior, even as a young guy. 1 Samuel 16, David came to Saul and entered into his service. Saul liked him, liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Now notice David's humility as he serves Saul. He knows that God has rejected Saul. He knows that he's been anointed the next king, but he serves Saul anyway. He never lifts himself up. Instead, David lives to lift up God. In fact, people would look at David and they would say, God is with him. It reminds me of another character in the Bible who the same thing was said about. Joseph in Genesis. They would look at him and say, God is with him. His character is marked by humility and people see the same thing in David. In his humility, David was patient. A part of patience, quite frankly, is humility. And we see this in David. David had to wait 15 years before he actually becomes king. For seven of those years, he's a fugitive. He's hunted by an angry, jealous, insane king named Saul. And he's enraged at David. He throws a spear at David twice as he's playing his harp. And David's on the run. He's hiding in caves from Saul. And he has to wait 15 years for God to fulfill his purpose. How many days did Saul wait for God until he finally took matters into his own hand? Seven days. He couldn't wait any longer than seven days. How many years did David wait for God to fulfill his promise? He waited 15 years. And seven of those, he was on the run, hiding in caves, hunted by Saul. When God looks for someone he can work with, he looks at somebody who's going to wait who's humble, who says, I'm gonna, not going to take matters into my own hands, God. I'm going to wait on you. I know you've got a plan for my life. I know you know what's best for my life, so I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to humble myself before you, and I'm going to wait for you to leave. Let's face it, waiting is hard for us. Yet if we want a heart like David, we have to learn that, to be patient and wait on God. So is that the default of your heart? It doesn't mean that we're not going to sin. It doesn't mean that we're not going to drift away from time to time. We will. It means that this is what's wedding in our hearts. Humility and waiting on God. Secondly, David had integrity. <clears throat> Psalm 78 basically describes why David was chosen. It says this, God chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens, from tending the sheep. He brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. The Hebrew word for integrity here is toma. It means full and undivided. Basically, David had a heart that was filled up with God, not other stuff. It was undivided. When he made mistakes, and he did, 
He immediately asked God to purify him, to cleanse him, and to renew him. And if you read about David in 1 Samuel, you'll see that over and over and over again. He blows it, he makes mistakes. But when he does, he runs back to God and he says, please renew me, please cleanse me, please give me a new heart. His heart, David, it wasn't divided by pride or ego or jealousy. He never developed a hateful spirit against Saul. And that blows me away right there. On two different occasions, he had the opportunity to kill Saul, the man that was hunting him and wanted him dead. But he didn't. In fact, one of those scenes, his men said, there he is, David, get him. He's right there. David said, heaven forbid, I will not strike down God's anointing. He had a heart of integrity. He didn't have anger or hatred or resentment in his heart against Saul. Now, when you and I are harmed by somebody, whether it be verbal, <coughs> we can either act like a Saul and harden our hearts against that person, or maybe even God. And what happens? We become bitter inside. Poisoned. Or we can choose to release those resentments and that anger and that hurt to God, just like David did. What's the condition of our hearts? Have you been wronged? Have you been able to forgive that person who hurt you? Jesus says that if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And I've always wondered about that. Look at it this way. There's a throne in your heart. And your king sits on that throne. Now our king on that throne calls the shots. He's our primary audience. Our king controls us. And if we don't forgive somebody, guess what? Guess where we go? Guess what we do? We put them on the throne in our hearts. And they end up controlling us. I mean, sometimes we have such resentment and anger against somebody, and they're, they're walking through life and joy, and we're miserable. Because we can't let go of that anger. Because the anger is on the throne in our heart. If you live in bitterness, you're going to be controlled by the person who wronged you. You're going to have a divided heart. But God tells us to forgive. He wants us to forgive so he can sit on the throne in our hearts. He wants our hearts to be surrendered to him. God can't create something great out of us if we have a divided heart. Third, David was obedient. Acts chapter 13, it says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I ask him to do. In other words, God says that David was obedient. At his core, he was going to obey. Is he going to make mistakes? Yes, he did. We know them. He had impurities. He had cracks on the outside, but the core, his heart, was obedient. He submitted his heart to God. God chose David to lead because David knew how to follow first. God wants us to be leaders too, but he, he, if we're going to be good leaders, we need to learn how to follow first. We need to learn how to submit to our king and to obey, even when it seems a little bit crazy to us. 
And let's face it, sometimes God tells us to do things and it rubs us the wrong way. Yet that's what he wants. God wants us to have this kind of heart. If we're going to be an example, we need to learn how to follow the Lord first. At the core of obedience is a clear understanding that God knows best. Saul thought he knew best. David knew that God knows best. So what's your default? What's in your heart? Do you truly come under the authority of Scripture saying God knows what's best? I'll never forget one of the things that Eileen said in our discussion. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Or are you like Saul when you think you know best? Jesus says the wise man is like a man who builds his house on a firm foundation. The wise man hears Jesus' words, practices them, and applies them. He doesn't just hear them. He applies them. And when the rains come and the floods rise, his house, his marriage, his life, stands firm. Jesus says the fool hears his words but doesn't apply them. The fool doesn't necessarily say there's no God. The fool might even believe in Jesus' teaching. But the fool doesn't apply. The fool is like the man who built his house on the sand and when the rains come and the floods rise, we're told that his house is going to be washed away. So what is your default? Obedience or disobedience? For it, David had incredible trust in God. Let's back up to the story of David and Goliath. He's facing down the armies of Israel. Everyone's terrified. Remember we talked about that with Saul. And including David's brothers who were there on the front lines. But David comes in and he's confident. David's brothers are terrified, just like King Saul. <clears throat> Why do you think God passed over in the first place? The answer is simple. They trusted in their own power and ability. But David shows up and he asks, who's this guy that is taunting the armies of the living God? David's anger rises inside of him because his God is being challenged. And David says, I'll fight him. I'll go out against Goliath. And people wonder, where did that confidence come from that would enable him to fight this nine-foot-tall warrior? But David says it. He says it to Saul when he asks to go out and fight the lion. He says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. I ask you, who would you rather go up against? A big old grizzly bear who's ticked off? A lion who's hungry? Or a nine foot tall man? I think if you put all three of those together, Goliath is the least of all of them. David, he's going back in his past. He's saying, God delivered me here. He delivered me here. He's going to deliver me now. That's where his confidence came from. David says God has been faithful in the past. He faced giants before, and he knew God would be with him as he faced this giant Goliath. David believed he had faith in his heart. He had no doubts. He had faith that God would empower him. And God says to us, I want you to face life with faith. I want you to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to understand that through him you are more than a conqueror. I want you to understand that with him all things are possible. 
I want you to face the giants in your life with faith. I don't want you to hide in fear behind the baggage. I want you to face them with faith. This is the heart that I can mold, that I can shape, that I can do great things with. Fifth, David was genuinely repentant. Having a heart after God's own heart doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. We need to get that through our minds. However, it does mean that you will need to be repentant. It means that when you sin, you won't remain in sin. In fact, 1 John says that those who abide in Christ do not remain in sin. John isn't saying that you're not going to sin. He's just saying essentially that when you do, you're not going to be comfortable there. You're not going to stay there. But you're going to go to God in repentance. Lord, I messed up. Again. And you know what? That's exactly what the devil doesn't want us to do. That's what David did. He repented after his affair with, the, his affair with Bathsheba. This is what he wrote in Psalm 51. Create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Before God can do anything great, we need to give our hearts to him, our cores. Our hearts should resemble that of David, not Saul. Some of us, maybe as we evaluate, we might find that we have more in common with Saul than we do David. Maybe we've become comfortable with sinning remaining in sin. Maybe we've not run back to God and repented. If that's the case, we need a new heart. We need to echo this prayer that David prayed. Because God wants to give us a new start, a new heart. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed. Now the text doesn't say partially committed. It says fully committed. God wants our hearts to be fully given to him. So we need to ask ourselves, is that true of you? If our heart is fully committed, God wants to strengthen us. He wants to use us. If it isn't like that, He can't. He can't use us. So we have to return to the Lord. 1 Peter 3.15, it says, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Let him be on the throne. Is Christ the Lord of your life? What is your default? Does it look more like Saul's heart? Or more like David's heart? You can change all that. Create in me a <coughs> new heart. Lord. I want to be fully committed. Each week we're reminded that's the way it should be as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We're reminded what Christ did for us. <clears throat> We're reminded that he's greater than our sin. We're reminded that anyone <clears throat> who comes to him sincerely, he will take them and shape them and mold them. He's concerned about the heart, that's what he would say. Not the words that need to be blow from our mouths. At Eileen's wake, <clears throat> one of the things that I said is that she preached sermons to me on a regular basis. 
but didn't say a word. We want our hearts to be like that too. What's your default? That you may need to have some talks with God. Would you mess up? Yeah. But we're gonna. We're all gonna. But all that means is about face and run to Jesus as fast as we can. He understands our weaknesses. He gets them. He made us. He just wants somebody whose heart is like a baby's heart. The imperfection and the purities on the outside are not what he looks at. He looks at the core. As we celebrate communion together, let's think about where our hearts are. Maybe we can have a couple guys come up and just do